Hello. I want to return to this book, which I did an intro to a couple of years ago, and it's one of our most frequently watched videos, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. And Richard Hofstetter's book, which won a Pulitzer Prize back around 1963 for nonfiction, back in the day when JFK was president of the United States, this book, uh, and our video of it, has apparently received a spike in interest lately, judging by our figures anyway. Most people are worried about the shape of American life, where we're going, and I can't blame them. And he was too, Hofstetter, back when he wrote this book, and I guess thought it through in the 1950s. He was worried, like many of those who were educators in America at the time, about the direction of things during the McCarthy era and beyond. So he goes in the in, in the in the intro to the book, he, he in chapter one deals with the motivation to write the book itself. And Ofstetter explains it this way. Although this book deals mainly with certain aspects of the remoter American past, in other words, mostly deals with the early history of anti intellectualism in the nineteenth century for the most part, it was conceived in response to the political and intellectual conditions of the nineteen fifties. During that decade, the term anti-intellectualism, only rarely heard before, became a familiar part of our national vocabulary of self-recrimination and intramural abuse. In the past, American intellectuals were often discouraged or embittered by the national disrespect for mind, but it is hard to recall a time when large numbers of people outside the intellectual community shared their concern or when self-criticism on this count took on the character of a nationwide movement. Primarily, it was McCarthyism which aroused the fear that the critical mind was at a ruinous discount in this country. Of course, intellectuals were not the only targets of McCarthy's constant detonations. He was after a bigger game. But intellectuals were in the line of fire, and it seemed to give special rejoicing to his followers when they were hit. His sorties against intellectuals and universities were emulated throughout the country by a host of less exalted inquisitors. Then, in the atmosphere of fervent malice and humorless imbecility stirred up by McCarthy's barrage of accusations, the campaign of 1952 dramatized the contrast between intellect and philistinism in the opposing candidates. On one side was Adlai Stevenson, a politician of uncommon mind and style, whose appeal to intellectuals overshadowed anything in recent history. On the other was Dwight D. Eisenhower, conventional in mind, relatively inarticulate, harnessed to the unpalatable Nixon, and waging a campaign whose tone seemed to be less set less by the general himself than by his running mate and the McCarthyite wing of his party. Eisenhower's decisive victory was taken both by the intellectuals themselves and by their critics as a measure of their repudiation by America. Time, the weekly magazine of opinion, shook its head in an unconvincing imitation of concern. Eisenhower's victory, it said, discloses an alarming fact long suspected there is a wide and unhealthy gap between the American intellectuals and the people. End of quote from Time. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., in a mordant protest written soon after the election, found the in intellectual, quote, in a situation that he has not known for a generation, end of quote. After 20 years of democratic rule, during which the intellectual had been in the main understood and respected, business had come back into power, bringing with it the vulgarization which has been the almost invariable consequence of business supremacy. Now the intellectual, dismissed as an egghead, an oddity, would be governed by a party which had little use for or understanding of him, and would be made the scapegoat for everything that, from the income tax to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Anti intellectualism, Schlesinger remarked, has long been the anti Semitism of the businessman. The intellectual is on the run today in American society. That is Schlesinger in an article in the Partisan Review.
Hofstetter goes on, all this seemed to be amply justified when the new administration got underway. The replacement, in Stevenson's phrase, of the new dealers by the car dealers seemed to make final the repudiation of intellectuals and their values. They had already been overshadowed by the courthouse politicians of the Truman years. The country was now treated to Charles E. Wilson's sallies at Pure Research, to stories about Eisenhower's fondness for Western fiction as reading matter, and to his definition of an intellectual as a wordy and pretentious man. But during the Eisenhower administration, the national mood reached a turning point. The Mar McCarthyite rage, confronted by a Republican president, burned itself out. The senator from Wisconsin isolated himself, was censured and deflated. Finally, in 1957, the launching of the Sputnik by the Soviets precipitated one of the, those periodic surges of self-conscious national reappraisal to which the American public is prone. The Sputnik was more than a shock to American national vanity. It brought an immense amount of attention to bear on the consequences of anti-intellectualism in the school system and in American life at large. Suddenly, the national distaste for intellect appeared to be not just a disgrace, but a hazard to survival. After assuming for some years that its main concern with teachers was to examine them for disloyalty, the nation now began to worry about their new low sal their low salaries. Scientists who had been saying for years that the growing obsession with security was demoralizing to research suddenly found receptive listeners. Cries of protest against the slackness of American education, hitherto raised only by a small number of educational critics, were now taken up by television, mass magazines, businessmen, scientists, politicians, admirable admirals and university presidents, and soon swelled into a national chorus of self-reproach. Of course, all this did not immediately cause the vigilante mind to disappear, nor did it disperse anti-intellectualism as a force in American life. Even in the sphere most immediately affected, that of education, the ruling passion of the public seemed to be for producing more Sputniks, not for developing more intellect. And some of the new rhetoric about education almost suggested that gifted children were to be regarded as resources in the Cold War. But the atmosphere did change notably. In 1952, only intellectuals seemed much disturbed by the specter of anti-intellectualism. By 1958, the idea that this might be an important and even a dangerous national failing was persuasive to most thinking people. Today, it is possible to look at the political culture of the 1950s with some detachment. If there was then a tendency to see in McCarthyism, and even in the Eisenhower administration, some apocalypse for intellectuals in public life, it is no longer possible now that Washington has again become so hospitable to Harvard prof professors and ex rhodes scholars. If there was a suspicion that intellect had become a hopeless obstacle to success in politics or administration, it must surely have been put to rest by the new president's obvious interest in ideas and respect for intellectuals. And of course that new president is JFK. So unfortunately for us and for America, Richard Hofstetter didn't live to see the 70s, although he lived to see the assassination later the year of his winning the Pulitzer Prize, the assassination of JFK and then the new president Lyndon B. Johnson and then the new president in 1968, Richard Nixon himself, who <laughs> seems to be the motivator of this uh, great intellectual effort, anti-intellectualism in American life. So we'll go on to analyze next time the uh, with, with Hofstetter, of course, the, the ambiguity of America about intellectual uh, adventures, because it's not, it's not one-sided and it's not simple. A lot of people, while admiring the, the uh, life of the mind, in some sense, limit themselves. So we would probably call them today the people who are not capable of thinking outside their their box and, and that tendency you can see uh, worried 
Hofstetter back here in 1962, but not over much. I think he was he was saying that all we needed was balance, and that he did not think. I think we'll find out in subsequent chapters of this book. He did not think that this was going to destroy the fabric of American life. But his analysis is so acute. I think in these days, almost 60 years on, we have to go over the same history Hofstetter did and take the pulse of America yet again as he did in 1962.